Today's video is a discussion video on some potential off-season moves by the Montreal Canadiens. I came across an interesting article in the Montreal Gazette that I wanted to discuss with you here today. Should the Montreal Canadiens go the route of signing a big-name unrestricted free agent or going the route of an offer sheet to really add a dynamic forward this summer? We'll discuss the article and give you my thoughts coming up next. Welcome back to another video here at Top Shelf Hockey. If you're new to the channel, thanks for stopping by. We review and discuss all 31 NHL teams, so if you're a huge hockey fan, consider subscribing and clicking the bell so you don't miss anything. So I have an article from the Montreal Gazette that I found interesting that I wanted to discuss with you here today, seeing what strategy would work better for the Montreal Canadiens, not only short term, but long term. As we had discussed in our Montreal Canadiens dedicated off-season plan video, and if you missed that, I'll link it up here in the YouTube cards. Um, we did discuss the fact that they needed to do a couple things this summer to really give their team a boost for next year. And ideally, they need a left shot defenseman who could play in the top four, and they could also use another dynamic forward. And how is the best way for them to go about accomplishing that? Well, this article here kind of goes about two different routes, and we'll get into each one here. So before I give you my thoughts on what I think they should do, I'm going to put up some uh, clips here from the article and read through here with you to see what their opinions are. If you want to read the full entire article, there will be a link down below in the description or the pinned comment, so look for that down there. This is just some excerpts here that I want to cover the main points. So let's get started here by saying, as for Duchesne, the rumor mill says the Montreal Canadiens are pursuing him at first glance. Montreal has the cap space to overpay him an $8 to $9 million per season. According to the folks at CapFriendly.com, Bergevin is at $10 million under the cap, which is expected to go up by another $4 million next season. Before you start throwing money at Duchesne in a long-term deal, you have to consider the Canadians have to deal with Max Domi next summer, while Brendan Gallagher, Philip Deneau, and Thomas Tatar became UFAs in 2021. This first part of the article is discussing the fact that the Montreal Canadiens are heavily expected to be in on Matt Duchesne as a potential top free agent center in this year's free agent class. The article goes on to say here, there is one long-term big money deal that is worth pursuing, and that involves an offer sheet for Mitch Marner, who is a Toronto Maple Leafs best player. Offer sheets are rare, and GMs who offer them run the risk of upsetting their peers. But Bergevin noted in his season-ending address to the media that they represent an available tool, and Marner is worth the shot. One impediment to offer sheets is the compensation due if they are successful. If the Canadians offered Marner a salary between eight and a half and ten and a half million dollars and were successful, the Canadians would have to give up to the Leafs two first-round draft choices as well as a second rounder and a third rounder. Bergevin hates giving up draft picks, but that is a fair price to pay for a 22-year-old who is already an established star in the NHL. Of course, the Leafs would have the opportunity to match the Canadians' offer. Nine out of ten offer sheets have been matched, but that would represent a win for another kind for Montreal. Leafs have serious salary cap issues after giving big money deals to John Tavares, Austin Matthews, and William Nylander. Even without an offer sheet, the Leafs are going to have problems satisfying Marner, who has to get more than the $7 million they gave Nylander. Obviously, this part of the article is certainly suggesting the Leafs have some tough choices to make this summer, which we've already discussed at great length in various videos on this channel here in the last little while. Uh, the Leafs do have some tough choices to make. They do have long-term deals in place for Tavares, Matthews, and Nylander now. Things are getting a little bit tight, and obviously Mitch Barner is a very important piece in their equation there to really move things along in Toronto. They need to retain him ideally for their own sake, but it's going to cost them a pretty penny and might have a very complicated negotiation process this summer. Now, the article goes on to say here, there is an argument to be made that Canadians can move forward without nothing more than a minor tune-up. The urgency to help up the middle is gone, but it would be nice to add a top six forward, preferably someone who can help on the power play. A left-handed defenseman is another priority, and until Charlie Lindgren shows he can do the job, an experienced backup goaltender is a must. Now, these are all items that we discussed in our 2019 off-season plan video for Montreal. I very much agree with the analysis here on what the Canadians need. A playmaking top six forward would be excellent. A left shot defenseman would be ideal in the top four, ideally even top two if they can do it. And it's certainly a backup goaltender. I'm not sure Charlie Lindgren is that guy yet but they do have to go down that road of having an insurance net minder in place just in case. The article goes on to say, there's a variety of affordable mid-range forwards who might be available in free agency. Players like Brock Nelson, Anders Lee, Michael Furlan, Brett Connolly. And if Bergman is looking for a low-rent offer sheet candidate, he could consider to leave Kasperi Kapanen, who would feel right at home with Montreal's growing Finnish population. There are some lessons that Canadians can learn from this year's playoffs. For starters, the value of high-priced snipers can be overrated. 
Remember last summer when John Tavares was the big catch for the Maple Leafs? The odds makers installed the Leafs as a Stanley Cup favorite pretty much right away. And while Tavares had a good season, the Leafs were bounced in round one of the Stanley Cup playoffs. These playoffs show there is no correlation between high scoring stars and playoff success. And the final four lineup illustrates the truth that once a team makes the playoffs, anything can happen. If you look at the top 25 scorers in the NHL, you'll see that only two of them, Boston's Brad Marchand and San Jose defenseman Brent Burns, are still playing. The four division leaders were all bounced in the first round, and they combined to win a total of six games. This article does drive a lot of points home, and I do agree with a, a big chunk of it here. Obviously, these 2019 Stanley Cup playoffs have proven that once you get into playoffs, anything can happen. You don't have to have the top scorer in the league to be a top playoff contender here and Stanley Cup favorite. I do agree with the fact that last year, we did see the Maple Leafs really catapult near the top of Stanley Cup favorites after they signed John Tavares. And I, you can't say that the John Tavares experiment in Toronto didn't work out. I was obviously, he had a phenomenal year. Playing with Mitch Marner was a great uh, one-two punch for them. Really helped Tavares. That helped Marner. It was good for the team. Overall, offensively speaking, he did well. But are the Leafs a better team overall? It's certainly tough to say because they didn't go any further in the playoffs. At the same time, though, this team certainly is a work in progress and has made a lot of progress over the last number of years. And Montreal is certainly trying to follow a similar type of path here. All four of the division winners were out early in the playoffs, which meant that all four wildcard teams advanced in the playoffs. Some of them, like Carolina, for example, look how far they went with the lowest payroll in the NHL. So it's not always a matter of highest scoring, highest paid, that necessarily guarantees you anything close to a Stanley Cup. While the Montreal Canadiens could pursue a forward like Matt Duchesne, who's a top center, certainly had a great time in Ottawa. He's, you know, he has a good pass in Colorado as well. Did uh, take a little while to get adjusted in Ottawa. Took him a while to get adjusted in Columbus. But once the adjustments settled in, his point production really picked up. But I guess one thing to keep in mind here is not that Matt Duchesne's not old by any means, but he's certainly entering the latter part of his 20s here. You sign him to a long-term deal, you know, six, seven years. Uh, that's going to take him into his mid to late 30s uh, when players are certainly declining. So signing a player at that age, even though they're a really solid player now, uh, th there is some risk involved longer term. And you know you're going to have to give the term to get the player in these cases. Players want the security. They want to make sure that they're well satisfied financially and contract wise you know into the latter years of their nhl career going down the route of an offer sheet or making a trade you're bound to get uh, you know a top player who's 22 23 years old that you can lock up longer term as well here and certainly get the much more productive prime years out of them and get more bang for your buck so there's certainly an argument to be made i think for both cases uh, obviously you go down the route of a matt duchene you don't have to give up anything you sign him as a free agent you add him to your lineup but then you have that risk later on of when things start to decline or you go down the route of an offer sheet, get a top name RFA like a Mitch Marner, for example. Uh, you get the prime years now, but then you do have to give up some decent compensation. We'll look now at a newly updated 2019 offer sheet model for RFAs here. Just in case we do see offer sheets this summer, I want you to understand exactly how this works. So as you can see on the screen, depending on the size of the contract is going to determine what the compensation is. If you're looking at some smaller deals, like a 2.1 million to 4.2 million, that's not bad. It's a second round pick. Uh, from 4.2 to 6.3 million dollar deals you're looking at a first and a third which still is not too bad when you think about it uh, 6.3 to 8.45 you're looking at a first second and third so again depending on the player maybe not too bad but once you get above that it starts getting kind of hefty when you go from 8.45 to 10.56 looking at two first round picks a second and a third so you're starting to really mortgage your future here so it better work out and if you go anything above 10.56 four first round selections now my only concern with the theory here is that if they did go down the route of trying to offer sheet mitch marner personally unless they go above the 10.5 million i don't see them having a legitimate shot at being successful i know we've seen all kinds of speculation of what marner wants for money we've seen that he wants austin matthews money you know you're looking at around 11 to 11 and a half million dollars so obviously if the leafs offer him that i think there's a pretty good chance he'll accept and, st and stay um secondly though if they don't and they want to get him closer to nine and a half ten which has been speculated as well if montreal comes in or anybody for that matter comes in with an offer sheet uh, under 10.5 million i see the leafs matching it and i don't see it going anywhere so obviously if you're going to do an offer sheet you kind of want it to be successful at least you're going to get the player you give up the compensation you move on if it's unsuccessful and the player signs and just uses it as a negotiating tool you're running the risk of upsetting your peers and at the same time not getting a successful player added to your roster so i don't know that montreal can really go down this road and be successful even though it is a pretty good opportunity here to land themselves a nice young successful hockey player 
If you're going to give up that much compensation in the form of four first-round picks, I think Bergevin would be better off to try to make a trade instead of going down the offer sheet route. Talk to teams like the Maple Leafs, you know, like the Tampa Bay Lightning, like the Winnipeg Jets, who have big-name RFAs that need new contracts but don't have the cap space to satisfy everything without making some moves. You know these teams are going to have to make moves, but instead of giving up four first-round picks, then obviously you could probably get yourself a better deal by going down the route of a trade. You could probably get something off your roster to offset some of the, the money you're going to have to pay this player and you know give up maybe less draft picks or something. Either way, I just can't imagine that if a team offered a trade for Mitch Burner that they would want to give up four first-round picks. As much as he's a great dynamic hockey player, it is risky to a sense. I mean, you better guarantee that Mitch Burner is going to make you good enough that you're going to be in the playoffs for those four years, for one, and that you're going to be able to go deep enough and finish high enough in the standings that those picks are all late first-round picks. Otherwise, you could very well run the risk of really giving up a lot for one player. So the big question I'd like for you to leave a comment down below. Obviously, if you have the option here as Montreal Canadiens fans to sign a big name UFA, they might be older into their later 20s. You might have to pony up a seven-year deal with some big money and risk having that player on your books into their later years where they likely could decline in production. Or you had the opportunity to go down the route of an offer sheet here and risk giving up some pretty substantial compensation but landing a much younger, possibly even more productive player. Which route would you prefer? Or do you think if adding that top six forward, Mark Bergman is better off to try to land himself a trade here and maybe limit the compensation so it's not all so many draft picks for the future let me know your comments down below and we will continue the conversation if you're new to the channel here hope you consider subscribing we cover all 31 nhl teams and there's plenty of content here for all hockey fans to enjoy if you're new subscribe for more videos just like this one and give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it i'd appreciate it if you did as always thank you for watching and i will catch you next time